All right, thank you very much for, uh, um, for this opportunity to tell you about what we are doing recently. Uh, this is a, a really recent uh, result that I'm going to show you. Uh, the setup from NESPEC uh, was installed really a few weeks ago, literally. I mean, and the data was collected in the last, really, literally few days. So nothing is well thought of yet, and everything is kind of new for us as well. But we have some nice data that uh, I think... Uh, you know, what I really want to do is really to give you a feel of where we are going with this and the potential of this, uh, uh, what I'm going to show you, instead of really a deep physics and what we learn and things like that. The talk is not anything like that at all yet. Um, so uh, I think I, Rainer said, my name is Johan Sabata, I'm at University of Georgia, uh, and uh, I've uh, been there just two years, so... Uh, I will just start telling you about uh, what we are doing. So as a, a new uh, professor in some school, you know, school, I have to write proposals, and uh, this was out of that, really. This came out of that, uh, those proposals. And the, uh, we've heard a lot of talks on elastic scattering snow, and the inelastic part is also uh, extremely potential, has huge potential, particularly uh, in quantum information uh, uh, science, which is a hot topic at the moment, and also in biology. So I'm going to show you just a few examples of these two. In particular, in the second one, I'll show you one slide, but it's my favorite one, uh, how we can use uh, the TIP uh, enhanced photoluminescence uh, actually to do uh, biological stuff. We just started doing that, uh, and I'll show you just one slide. So just a little bit more on this. Quantum information, one is interested in you know, single photon emission and entanglement and so forth. What could the tip do? Well, one can use the tip to create a cavity uh, between a surface and the tip itself and enhance signal and as well as uh, also uh, really twin and control single emitters and, uh, and so forth. So that is kind of the motivation. For biology, uh, you know, we don't, they don't call it photoluminescence, but they call it fluorescence imaging, is quite established uh, uh, technique to image dynamics of particles in uh, systems in biology. And the question is, what would the tip do in that situation where you do not have to demodulate, uh, you do not care about really the demodulation of the tip, you can see this... Uh, photoluminescence particles in water, for example, and what could the tip do there? And maybe, uh, in my opinion, has a more potential than in a non-FTIR, but it will, uh, it remains to be seen. First, let me give you an overview of my lab very quickly. This is a simulation of the lab, and I was told strictly not to show the set schematics. So what I did was I added some music, and, uh, but unfortunately, there's no speaker, so I'm going to try to go closer to this and see if you can hear this. And so everybody can wake up a little bit. Uh, my volume is not working, which is unfortunate. I really have to make this work. Let's see. Here's the microphone. The microphone. Oh, yes. Awesome. Thank you, Raina. So let me just, this is really my lab. And it's to scale, okay? So uh, you can visit uh, my lab pretty quickly here. What's the matter with the music doesn't... Oh, this is too bad. Something is not right here. But anyway, this is what my lab looks like. Um, a bunch of empty tables. There's two tables. This is a key table. Two tables combined. And uh, actually, uh, what's interesting here is uh, that... Uh, let me just go back a little bit, right here. Uh, so what I did was I combined, this is uh, the famous NESPEC, NESPEC rules. I'm sure everybody agrees in this, in this, in this conference. Uh, and here is the AutoCube 800 uh, uh, cryostat. So they both share the same spectrometer and laser. So they're combined in that way. So we do things back and forth between these two. So this is a cheaper version of cryosnome, I guess. Um, 
And uh, really, so the setup uh, uh, really has, uh, it's just a regular SNOM, except that we have a spectrometer on this side. So we collect an elastic scatter in both Raman and photoluminescence in the forward direction. So if you zoom in, this is what it looks like. The tip oscillates there, and you just collect photoluminescence directly in that way. So, uh, and as I said, we can also do far-field uh, photoluminescence and imaging in uh, uh, using the cryo at low temperature. So the first thing to one has to do when you have a new system is, of course, to find a, a, a system to calibrate. And WSC2 monolayer is well characterized. Both the Raman peak and the photoluminescence peaks are well, well known. So in addition, this uh, monolayer has something very interesting, and that is it has a dark exciton uh, uh, mode that uh, requires uh, polarization out of plane. One has to polarize the incoming beam out of plane in order to excite a dark exciton. And so that is an interesting uh, 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 kind of setup to, uh, to, to test uh, whether uh, with a tip we can do, we can look at this dark exciton. So I'm going to show you some things along these lines. So the fir first data I'm going to show you is this. Here is a, a, a monolayer uh, WSC2 and uh, a bilayer WSC2. We just happened to find this sample and on, exfoliated on gold. And here is the data. Uh, this is with the tip. When you approach the tip, the tip, by the way, is uh, on a tapping mode, and the signal without tip is quite small. This is not the whole story. Sometimes this could reverse. The, tip, the signal with the tip could be smaller than the signal without the tip if you have a large, uh, a large uh, sample because it's, there is no demodulation. The spectrometer sees everything, and so if it's larger, the signal becomes larger from a larger flake, and the contribution from the tip enhancement becomes smaller but not in this case. So this is uh, something interesting, which is uh, not the case for uh, any kind of snow uh, measurement with uh, demodulation. On the bilayer, you could see that this, this is what the photoluminescence peak looks like. And without, uh, without the tip, it's quite kind of broad, and uh, the signal is weaker. So we've seen enhancement up to, you know, it's, it's really uh, kind of tricky to put numbers too early we need to do more work, but up to a factor of 10 or so uh, enhancement. And you can go back and forth uh, uh, between these two flakes, and you can see the different uh, photoluminescence signal on, on, on each of them. The other thing is also Raman. Uh, uh, and one other thing is also tapping versus uh, 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 now Nespec has a capability to do contact mode. And with the contact mode, uh, we have a little bit of hard time uh, controlling the distance between the surface and the tip. But one can do that. And the spectrum actually has a different shape in that case. Uh, this is quite important, particularly when you want to excite the dark excitons. Uh, but we have, as I said, um, one reason I'm here is to talk to NESPEC people to uh, be able, I, um, I've heard that there is a, now a new button to control the distance between tip and sample, which we're very excited about uh, in a, a contact mode. Uh, this is actually was the original signal, and the student just removed this one uh, spectrum and sent me the earlier one. But this actually, I like this very much because it, can, it shows the enhancement with and without tip in both contact and tapping mode. Uh, uh, operation. Uh, the problem with the contact mode, at least at the moment, is it just drops, it seems to me, yeah, because it destroys kind of your sample if, if you're just on contact mode. So this, uh, I hope, will be fixed soon. The Raman uh, uh, also is important. I'm not really a Raman person, but uh, one can also do tip-enhanced Raman with this, and uh, this is really what you expect in the far field as well. Uh, at the mono layer shifts uh, compared to the uh, uh, thicker samples. Uh, and uh, we have arranged this five times, but this is actually what you get from, uh, from the uh, unprocessed data. So you can see uh, what I did here. 
So, so far, all of this you could do without tip. You don't really need tip for all of what I've told you. Uh, uh, but what the tip becomes important when you try to do other things, such as, for example, control or image a local plasmon of, uh, you know, a plasmonic material and interaction with the, with the sample. So what we did is we exfoliated a monolayer on gold nanoholes and, and covered the gold nanoholes. This is a transfer technique. And, uh, of course, uh, first we imaged the nanohole uh, plasmon local modes, and uh, we're using a metal tip. So you don't see the dipoles very nicely here, but this is actually what the dipole looks like on each hole. Uh, when you have a metal tip, as you know, it disturbs the local plasmon, so it becomes part of the uh, near field, and it's hard to resolve them, but some of them are better than others. For example, here you can see the dipole modes better, even with a metal tip, when the laser is polarized in plane. And when you polarize it out of plane, or in, in the uh, P-polarized, you see a different uh, 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 field distribution. This is quite well known. The question then is, what happens to all of this photoluminescence and, uh, and Raman and so forth uh, and, and with a tip in this kind of system? So uh, one strange thing we're still trying to understand is uh, this. This is a, a terse uh, uh, image on uh, monolayer WAC2 on gold nanohole, which are plasmonic, and the uh, laser in this case is, I believe, uh, didn't put it here, it's uh, P polarized, and you can see the huge uh, difference between uh, the gold terse and that of the terse we find when we exfoliate a monolayer on these nanoholes. And uh, I'm, I'm not sure yet what's going on. It seems to me that maybe strain issues on the, on the, uh, on the nanoholes that shifts these Raman peaks. But again, this is something in work in progress. Uh, the other thing is one can also see uh, polarization uh, control or difference between the uh, tip-enhanced signal uh, of photoluminescence. Uh, in the far field, without the tip, in this case, the signal is much larger. Here it's uh, kind of normalized uh, compared to uh, the uh, signal with the tip. The reason is the sample, is, the monolayer is very large, and it covers a large area of these nano holes. And so the contribution from the tip is much weaker compared to what you collect from the rest of the sample. And so the signal in this case is large. However, the polarization uh, 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 differences are the same in both cases. With p-polarized and s-polarized, you always get a larger signal with p-polarized uh, compared to the s-polarized uh, signal. So it seems that um, the contribution from the tip, the local field enhancement uh, due to the tip is a larger contributor, uh, even though these uh, uh, bright excitons uh, are uh, you know, their polarization is in plane, in the plane of the sample. So you get a much larger, a larger signal in the p-polarized case. What we did not see in all of this is what we wanted uh, in the first place, which is to try to extract the dark exciton results. Uh, and that has been done by Marcus Rashke's group, and uh, so far uh, we do not see any indication of that. We have to play with the laser uh, power and average more or so, but so far the uh, uh, still work in progress. I, I just have to say that. Here is also another uh, in interesting data, again, very fresh data. Uh, with tip and without tip, you can see the, uh, 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 the Raman shift is actually larger uh, when you have uh, no tip in this case. This is also quite interesting. This is done on nano holes, uh, and uh, in both P and S polarized, the signal is larger when you do not have the tip, actually. Uh, you can also do this uh, hyperspectral imaging on, uh, uh, on these samples. The hyperspectral image here is diffraction limited, of course. 
and uh, you get something like this. And if you, uh, uh, this is a flake here. Uh, it's, a, it's a large flake. And we did a very low resolution hyperspectral image. That means collect uh, spectrum at each pixel uh, on a certain number of pixels on a line and form a, a 3D image. And uh, the uh, preliminary data is quite encouraging. Uh, if you just section this, you can see, uh, for example, here, uh, when you have this, uh, uh, the, the signal goes on and off uh, when you are on resonance and off resonance. So uh, it's quite early, but it's quite encouraging. OK. so. Uh, the last one minute, I'm going to show you just one slide on uh, what I promised you on this biology. We have, I have a colleague who makes afterglow particles. These are, uh, uh, these are particles that you shine UV light on them, and then they glow afterwards for a while. And what we did is we uh, uh, basically what... Uh, so this is the data from... Uh, um, I forgot to cite the paper, but from my collaborators. And th there is a peak, uh, photoluminescence afterglow peak at around 720 nanometer. And uh, he used them to track uh, biological systems. In fact, he has used them for uh, uh, real biology imaging. So uh, what we have found, what we are doing, is trying to see photoluminescence signal uh, at the tip, at a single particle level, and try to uh, use that data for you know, uh, tracking biosystems. Again, this is quite early, but we're very excited that we can see the signal from a single particle, photoluminescent signal from a single particle. So in the next, uh, uh, I think what we are trying to do this now is in the, to do this in water. If we put this in water, can we follow this particle at a single uh, particle level in, in, in solution. And so that is, hopefully in a year, we will have some uh, in, good results. So in conclusion, I think this kind of, uh, what I've really briefly talked about has potential on uh, in quantum uh, science as well as uh, for biological applications. And, and then I would like to thank a couple of people that have been very influential in my career. Particularly, Rainer Hellenbrand, he, uh, when I was uh, 11 years ago, I was a postdoc at Berkeley, and he came by some fate, you might say, came to visit Berkeley and gave a talk there. And I was trying to build a visible snow at the time. And of course, it was not working, and I was running out of time. And I showed him my setup, and he said, what are you doing? You're doing everything wrong. Why do you do, uh, first of all, in the visible snow? Why don't you go to the infrared? And then he invited me to <laughs> and, uh, his lab in Munich at the time. Uh, they were at the Max Planck in Gar what is this place called Martin Street. That was really a career change for me. The first day I went there it was amazing. Like I knew what I was doing wrong. First of all, that room was like a mail room. Vibration has nothing to do with snow, not very much. And and then I met another influential person. Uh, of course, Fritz Kylman. I knew him from his papers and everything. I, the god of everything I knew. And then he was skating in, in the corridor from his office to Reiner's office. And I said, this guy is really cool, so I have to know him more. And I've been really following his work ever since. And, Ryan, and Andy Huber was a student at the time. And uh, now he's a big shot in uh, Nespec. But, uh, he was also he's kept in touch uh, all these years. And later on, really after I came back from uh, Reiner's group, uh, Dimitri came to give a talk at Berkeley again, invited a physics department. And that was also a very important moment uh, to hear him talk and getting to know him. So with that, I think uh, I would like to thank you for your attention. <laughs>